president of Ions and a lovely person who knows all things veteran and MBE. Please give her a big welcome. Thank you very much. As um, Scott said, I am also a veteran. I'm a retired Army nurse um, and retired as a colonel in the Army Nurse Corps. And um, I'm not sure if it was, uh, it certainly was my path because this, being an Army nurse was how I got into this path of NDEs and dealing with everything I've been dealing with in IANS for the last 30 or 40 years. I was a young nurse in Vietnam, right out of nursing school. And um, of course we had casualties all the time. And this young man came in and he had his arm blown off and he started to tell me about this experience he had where he could feel himself up over the scene where the whole platoon had been um, bombed and he could see soldiers and himself on the ground and he could see the other spirits of soldiers and he said I knew who was going to die and who wasn't and then he went on to describe what I now know is a classic NDE pretty much I had no idea this was 1969 what he was talking about um, the fortunate thing was I knew enough not to say anything about it, um, but just listen. And so when I came home from Vietnam, I really had tucked that in the back of my mind and said, this is really profound. This is very important stuff. And, um, you know, I went on to my Army career. And in 1975 or six, um, I was in the University of Texas. Um, still in the Army, doing my doctoral degree. And I happened to be in New York, which Rochester, New York, which is my hometown. And um, my father had an MI. And I was with him when he was resuscitated. He was not a man that believed in any of these things, but he quickly told me about this experience. He obviously had had a near-death experience. And he said, I'm going to tell you about it, and we're not talking about it ever again. But for me, it was, this really is important. And I'm at a great place, you know, a big university with a big library. Um, and I'm studying decision-making behavior, so I thought, oh, boy, I could stand for something a little more interesting. And um, I, you know, I started reading things, but of course there wasn't much written unless it was in the School of Psychology, Mental Illness, or Religion. So that was my beginning. I had, before that, touched base with Nancy Evans Bush at the Yukon um, office when they very much started, and got involved at the very beginning, and went, you know, we went and de designed uh, Bruce and Raymond and all of us to Florida to design clinical guidelines. I mean. It just was my path, obviously. So I have been very, very concerned since Vietnam, since um, Desert Storm. I uh, retired after Desert Storm out of Germany. Um, the number of people who were having all these kinds of incidents and the number of vets that are returning to the United States to these vet centers. And of course, over the last eight years, I'm just appalled at the number of people and the kinds of injuries they're having. And so we have huge numbers of vets, which I know are having huge numbers of NDEs. Um, and they're having, on top of that, all kinds of psychological issues because this is their fourth or fifth tour and the obvious physical injuries of IUDs and trauma, lots of amputations, all those things. And my belief is that if we could acknowledge the NDEs and support them in those, 
they would be able to heal themselves faster and better of all these other traumas that they have. Um, I will have to say I think it's unconscionable that um, any young soldier spends four tours in a war zone because I know what it does just for one tour and the number of problems and things after four tours just multiply. Um, so we do owe them great dedication for their work. So these uh, vets are arriving in hospitals. Um, they get a lot of physical support. They have great um, rehab and they have some great um, psychological help, but they have very little help with NDEs. And as an example, um, as I've been talking to people, I went to a VA uh, close to me and went to the chief of the um, service for vets and I said, how would you differentiate a near-death experiencer who saw God and a soldier who was having a psychotic break who saw God? And I actually expected one answer, but the answer I got was, what's an NDE? <laughs> And it's like, oh my God, everybody's living under a rock. But what Pim said, and I heard him mention it this morning, physicians are very resistant to accepting this unless they have patients that they've talked to or unless they've read something. And there's, there is some literature in the physician literature but, uh, about NDEs, but not a lot. So we have a facility that's not there supporting them. On top of that, the disclosure issues for NDEers is, is huge. They have had all these problems. They are desperate to get benefits just to survive on. And so their first thought is, I better not tell anybody about this experience because it's going to make me sound too crazy. And they might not give me my benefits. And so the disclosure issues are, are, are big and real for them. Um, I have, and I was hoping to have today, I have looked for about three years for a Rocky veteran who had an NDE that would talk to me and I could interview. And you know, I put it out to the groups, I put it out to everybody. I have finally found one, but I mean, you, we know there's hundreds and thousands of them out there. And he, uh, on Monday, was in Florida and helping um, a vet's wife who was killed, getting some um, benefits and stuff. And as soon as that was ending, and he thought it would be Monday or two, he was going to drive directly here so that he could be our first Iraqi vet that we could interview about his NDE. Um, he obviously isn't here, so he's not going to be part of this talk. So my prayer will be, and we could all have a little prayer for this, that he'll arrive here tonight or in the morning and will be part of the NDE panel. Um, because we do want him to be able to say his story and, and help. Um, and, and I'm asking him to help me do some other things uh, for veterans. Because I think this um, phenomena uh, with the veterans is very, very different. People say, well, they can just get support at the Veterans Association. They're thrown into PTSD groups. They don't need therapy. They need somebody who can just listen to them and acknowledge the difficulties they're having and respect their disclosure issues and, and be there for them. And I'm hoping that we'll find ways to do that. One of my beliefs is if we can find enough of them and if we can find a media to let them know we're here and that we acknowledge they're having these NDEs and they don't have to tell anybody else, they can come back to us. And what I'd like to see us do in all the groups that we have are set up 
um, a support group with the facilitator that we currently have at each place initiate a group just for veterans. I, I think they shouldn't be mixed. And then find a veteran who will become the leader, but mentor them into this position. And I think, it's a ver I think it'll be a slow process, but I think it will work. We have group leaders here, and you know, you find one, more will come. You advertise, you do things, and then we get a separate group for uh, NDEers and their spouses. Because of the way the military works, the military spouses are going to be right out on a limb with them. And so they're going to need support for acknowledgement of what is an NDE, why have they changed so, why are they giving away all their money, you know, um, th these kinds of issues happen with regular NDEers. Um, and, and when I was on active duty, I used to teach this all the time, NDE 101. And I would have many people come to me, um, and, and fortunately I was, it was at a time in the 70s and early 80s that there still wasn't much out there. there you know, Raymond's book, a little of this and a little of that, but not a lot. So the military hierarchy, most of them thought I was crazy. They called me the death and dying lady. She's very interested in this death and dying stuff. I said, well, that's not exactly it, but sometimes it just took too long to explain it. But I would go into all the special areas, ICU, those places, and say, this is what an NDE is. And if you have patients that talk about this, please call me. And um, as I told uh, the group the other day, um, I once did that in a head nurses group, and she, she just looked at me like, oh my God, you know, you are crazy, and what are you doing here? And I, I could just read it off her face. And, you know, divine intervention has a way of dealing with things. And the next morning at 8 o'clock, she was on the phone saying, I got somebody over here who had one of those things. Come over here and help me. And, and of course, I did. But what I found in the military, I would have general officers call me and say, I don't want to tell you what my name is, but I had a near-death experience, and I would love to have somebody to talk to. Um, <clears throat> we had a young uh, commander in um, Germany, when I was in Germany, called me. He said, I'm a West Point graduate. I'm a commander of this unit. And I have all these young enlisted men, and they're always getting in trouble. And what I want to do is put my arm around them and say, we'll work this out together. Of course, you all know that's not the Army way. <laughs> put your arm around them and work it out together. You want to, you know, you're supposed to discipline them, and you're supposed to do this and this and this, none of which works very well if you don't do the other things. So I, I simply said to him, you and the Army are not going to work out. You can't be your authentic self if you stay in the Army. And, and so I have been dealing with this many, many years, both on active duty and off. And I'm absolutely amazed that I got to be a full bird colonel, because I know half of them thought, what is this woman talking about? But it gave me, because I saw all these veterans come in, um, and how desperate they were. We had, um, I was in Fitzsimmons here, Chief of Education. I get a phone call. My name is John, I'm, I'm stationed at Fort um, Lee, Kentucky or someplace. I'm a Master Sergeant and I need to talk to you. I saw your picture in the paper or something. So I know you know about NDEs and you were in uniform, so you must be on active duty. And I said, well, John, I'd love to talk to you. You can set up a phone call or something. Um, you know, we'll get together and talk about this. Two days later, he walks in my office and said, I'm here, I'm John, let's talk. And he was desperate.
to know he was okay. He's an old master sergeant. Things went the way they went because that's the way they always went. And now he's walking out. He had an aortic aneurysm that burst. Usually, you're dead before you ever get to the OR. And, and it, he lived through this. And his surgeon came and, and actually talked to me as well. But John said, you know, I can't, I'm so emotional and I see stuff out in nature and I want to cry and, you know, I don't know what's the matter with me. And I said, you're perfectly okay. And, you know, and then went through some of the after effects and this kind of thing. And for him, that's all he needed. But imagine these young guys, hundreds and thousands of them. Imagine the other part of it what we could do if they were all integrated, in tune, wanting to know about, I'm sure it would ruin the recruiting program for the services, but it will provide support and love and understanding for a lot of other people. And so I think it is absolutely essential that we find some different ways to deal with veterans other than the traditional ways. And I want IANS to be a big part of that. We are the group that should do this. We are the, the largest um, and most professional group to provide these people information that will be helpful. And it, it will help, I hope, that I'm a retired military officer, so I do have some sensitivities to their um, disclaimer issues. There are very real issues, getting benefits, telling things that might be hurtful. And um, having been in Vietnam, when we see lots and lots of soldiers come through, they are petrified young men. And having these horrible issues physically uh, is one thing, but all the rest of them in an NDE on top of it where they're seeing things. I had a young man that I interviewed from the Cuban Missile Crisis. He had his arm torn off through some truck accident. Was taken to the hospital. He was desperate because he had a very profound experience where he saw God and talked to God. So of course he wanted to share this information with everybody and they were very excited to hear this. And he did, and they sedated him for three days. And they found a psychiatrist, sent him directly to a psychiatrist, and he had a terrible time getting acknowledgement. I ended up doing um, a, and this is years ago, a video letter and, and letter to the VA to say, this is a real phenomenon. This happened to him, it's important, it is real. So we're still pretty much in that venue. And I want um, for us to try to smooth this path somehow. Getting information out to the veterans, and acknowledging that we know, we know, Wendy's, we will help you. We are the folks that can help you. We don't care about telling anybody about this so it will hurt your benefits. We only care about helping you integrate this experience into your life. And so for me, that's the, the key. I have several things that I've been trying to do. I do have a fund in IONS called the Colonel Corcoran Research Fund. And that is because I think they're going to need some training that we would do uh, and we've already done this. We have a professional lecture. We've collected articles. I would like to do an updated interview with a vet, an Iraqi vet. And then um, any other, we have lots of bibs and things now. Take it out to the VA hospital. And I would do the first lecture. And then I would hand it over to a champion. We need to find champions in these VA hospitals who will carry it on. Um, somebody from here, I can't see, is Trap here? I don't know, she's here. But she um, has a cardiologist 
that is very inter oh there she is right in front of me and um, that's very interested in this and she's interested so we could probably try to get something going there I'll go out do a continuing ed program work something with the cardiologist tr you know train the trainer and because I have found nurses are on deck they know it they see it they don't always know what to do about it so you fill that part in physicians and psychologists a lot of psychologists and social worker are just upset because they've never heard about it before and wonder why somebody didn't tell them in their training. So once they have gotten a lecture and this information, they're usually very willing to, to try to do something. So I want to try to continue that, but our biggest I think issue is getting the word and finding a way to get to the soldiers. Because you can't go to the VA and say, I'd like to go in the wards and talk to your soldiers about near-death experiences. What I have done, I feel more comfortable in some of the active duty hospitals, is I go in, I find a nurse or a doctor and say, if you hear these, and these are some things to look for, please refer them back to us and let, it, let us help them. But we need a better way than that because we've got to let them know there's somebody out here who cares about them and will, in fact, try to help them. So I'm always open to any ideas or people who have um, input um, or have a way into places that could help us do that. Um, I see, I see these time goes so fast. I have five minutes left, so I want to extend for a few questions before Robert comes up here, if you have any questions for me. We have a plan, we have the materials, we just need a way, and I'm hoping through some of the media, a way to find the veterans and help them find us and then use our own support groups to establish new ones. Any questions about that or comments? Hi, Diana. Hi. I am interested in helping you with this program. I did have a question. You appear to be reaching out to the individuals. And I heard you talk about going to the hospital nursing administration. Have you gone higher? Have you gone to the hospital senior officials and or active duty commanders and ask for the opportunity to share? We have um, in a few different places. They are so overwhelmed right now with just dealing with the number of patients they're getting, with the problems they're having, that although a few, and it's always better in person if you can find um, somebody that you know knows you or they were sympathetic to the issue but just said it's just not something we can do right now um, I find better if I can find a nurse I knew because most of my mentees are now chief nurses so I go out and look and say Who, who's out there I know uh, you know or chief of continuing ed so I can go back in and do a program I might be overreaching, but maybe we do need to reach higher. Maybe we need to reach at Army level, maybe uh, military force level, and not just address the indie ears, but the force as a whole. I remember that being a commander, we had issues come up where we had to do mandatory briefings. And I mean, you had to have a signature from every soldier that they heard that briefing. Maybe this is something that could be done that way be a big reach, but that way the NDEers aren't isolated. Yeah. Everybody's hearing a story and we give them an avenue to get counsel. It, it's certainly true that their families are is subject to this as well and it, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. I'll, I'll, it's we'll, we'll talk about know. this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do Nurses in VA hospitals require a certain number of hours of in-service. Oh, yes. 
have you ever done in service oh, training several. on NDE? Several. I've offered it to hospices and you know hospital staff. I think one of the problems is it, it really falls, it doesn't fall in the nursing realm, it doesn't fall in the social worker realm, you know, what realm does it fall in? The chaplains usually I've, I've done sometimes end up with it, but even as a chaplain, yeah. I did get a lot of really people refer to me in hospitals. Um, if the, the Navy has been very receptive to this, I say sadly, um, in that um, I did one at Portsmouth and the chaplains and nurses did it together. I have spoken at Shea Aaron, the Shea Aronson um, Symposium, which is a huge Navy symposium, and really at all levels of continuing education. Um, so it's something I really need to start doing again, Ian. I need to get a volunteer to send letters to all the hospitals and you know try to set it up. It's a great idea. Have you um, yourself or anyone who's been in the Army as a nurse written an article and gotten into the yes. Iraq Veterans Against the War newsletters and that sort of thing? Yeah, you have. Um, not in the veterans newsletters, but that is a good place to go. I've written several for nursing articles, even way back when. I wrote one in Nursing 88. That article is as pertinent today as it was then, but it would be helpful to get one in a veterans magazine. Exactly. Yeah. And what you're dealing with here, I'm sure everyone here knows, is, is, is changing people's worldview, yeah. whether they're in the Army, whether they're nurses, whatever, whatever, you're dealing with changing worldview and people resist that mightily. And repetition is just keep seeing it again and again and again referenced. I think it's, it's a, a great idea. Yeah. Again, it's one of those, we need some people with PR experience that can, you know, we can write the articles and we have articles, but we need somebody that can contact 20 Veterans Magazine and say, would you be interested in running? And Right now, we don't have anybody that has that kind of experience. So if there is somebody out there, we'd be happy to entertain that. Thanks, a great idea. Hi. Hi, Mo. Uh, Mo. And uh, the reason that I'm here is for the reason that you're talking about. Yes. I spoke to you a few minutes. Right. So I am just beginning leader in a new group in Palm Springs. And I was told that when I come back, so I'm gone for the summer, that uh, maybe I could have my support group after a certain group they have at the center because there should be a lot of vets there that would come on here to my group. So maybe this is one way to start. My, I can't see my purpose, so maybe the purpose of coming for me to have the veterans come only veterans to this group. But I'm not a computer person, so I don't do well with all this sending well, we're, we have to find some other people to help us in these realms and some media outlets because once they start coming, they will come by word of mouth. We just have to start the train. Thank you, Mo. I will. Thank you very much. And thank you, Diane. I am Robert Kaplan, a veteran since 1956. I joined the Navy <clears throat> to stay out of the military. <laughs> I, jo I joined the Navy so I could finish school, but I got drafted after a year into the Navy, active duty. And I was injured and died on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. But let me just give you a little bio on me because it's relevant to the whole veteran experience. When I was born, my parents divorced. I was an infant and I was placed in a Catholic foundling home because my mother had to work. And in 1937, it was a very big burden on both families if there was a divorce. Uh, I spent my first 
six years of life in three boarding situations. I was in a Catholic school, boarding school. I was in a Baptist home. And I was in a foster home. And then I went home and lived with my mother for four years, from the age of six to 10. And then I was sent off to a Catholic boarding school. My mother had a degree in music from a Catholic academy. And she felt secure in my welfare under the experience she had, the discipline and the, the scheduling and just the security that she was familiar with. So that's how I wound up being there. Um, in 1955, I joined the reserves. And in 1956, I was drafted and put on active duty and served on the USS Forrestal, which at the time was the second largest ship in the world, second by only three feet. The, U the USS Saratoga is three feet longer than the Forrestal. Um, I served as a plane captain on the flight deck. This is the fellow who helps the pilot with his gear and puts him in, you know, straps him into his seat, arms the ejection of that seat in case he has to eject out of the plane, and pre-flights the aircraft. Pre-flight is what they do with all planes, uh, commercial as well whereby they um, rev up the engines and test all the uh, movable parts and the hydraulic parts to make sure that they're going to function. So the last procedure of this pre-flight uh, is what is called the high power turn-up. And on the high power turn-up, uh, the pilot revs up the engine to 100% and tests all of his instruments under those conditions. It was during that time that somehow, after working on this job for six months, I stepped in front of the intake and was pulled in, all the way in. It's about eight foot in, and I slammed my head on the axle that houses the turbines. My arms were flung forward. And I was caught up in the turbine blades. They immediately, the pilot immediately sensed the different sound in the engine and cut the engines. But a man who saw this happen, there were several men that saw it, because the flight deck is very busy, uh, signaled the pilot to cut the engines. But the pilot was looking at his instruments. But he cut the engines probably within a second or a second and a half. Um, that man eventually uh, crawled in. When they pulled the plane to the side, got it out of the way of the launch position, uh, and they, they, they attempted to pull me out. That man crawled into the plane, the intake, and attempted to pull me out. But it was so hot in there, he had to retreat. So they decided that maybe they had to dismantle the plane. But that would have taken too long. So they waited for the plane to cool off somewhat. And he crawled in again with the scissors and cut my flight jacket off from the turbines. And they pulled me out and laid me on the deck. And I had no life signs. At which point, they called for the chaplain. Now, the ship had three chaplains, a Protestant, a Catholic, and a Jewish. My dog tag said I was Jewish. I was, my parents were Jewish. My father's side were Orthodox. My mother's side were Reformed. But nevertheless, even though I was in boarding schools, in Christian boarding schools, I uh, had Jewish uh, dog tags. But the Jewish chaplain, who was one of the dentists aboard, was in surgery and couldn't come up. So they called the Catholic chaplain. The Catholic chaplain came up, 
kneeled beside my body, took out a lavender ribbon from his flight gear, wrapped it around his neck, and began to give me last rites. I watched this from above. I had left my body, and I was watching the whole scene. I was 20 years old. It's hard to put this into words, but I perceive the anguish of the chaplain. He did not want to give me last rites. He was not the right person. He was Catholic, I was Jewish. Even though I had never practiced or been acculturated by Jew Jewish culture, I was j technically Jewish. Um, and he, and he, he had resistance. Uh, I cannot say that I felt his resistance, but I perceived his resistance. I came back into my body, I opened my eyes, and I said to him, Father, don't you know I'm Jewish? <laughs> At which point, he was like ashen. <laughs> I had no life signs, there was no movement in my body, and I'm speaking to him. <laughs> and he couldn't speak. I said, it's okay, Father, you'll do. <laughs> I frankly don't know what I would have said if it would have been a rabbi. <laughs> but no, so, they took me down to sick bay, and I was on an operating table. The, ships had, the ship had four, six doctors. Big ship, very big ship. 4,000 men, 25 stories high from the keel to the mast. Three football fields long. It was huge, it was a city. You've seen this on television, they're huge. So they had me on a gurney, and there were medical people, corpsmen and doctors, completely around. I watched this from the ceiling. I could feel the anguish. I use the word feel loosely. I perceived the anguish amongst the men that were working on me. Some felt I was not going to make it. I was already uh, dead. But Father Fitzpatrick told the, the head doctor that I had spoken to him. <laughs> so on the strength of that, and the strength of the fact that I, I had, they had lost my life signs, I didn't have any life signs, they called Father Fitzpatrick again. He gave me last rites a second time. I must admit that I'm a slow learner. <laughs> I watch these proceedings from the ceiling, a classic scene that you've heard many, many uh, NDEs describe. I cannot say that I had a life review in terms of scenes, but what I can say was I perceived what my life was about all at once. And these words were surfaced in my consciousness. I am the love I seek. I am the love I seek. In my medical records, I was basically unconscious for 48 hours. During that time, I was in and out of my body. And that particular statement is, is really somewhat awkward because those of you that have had near-death experiences know that the, the experience is really beyond words. 
When I was watching the doctors work on my body, it was as if the, the entire scene was coming from me. It wasn't out there. I was seeing it out there like a, like a hologram, but it was coming from me. It was as if I was creating that scene. And I was separate from the scene. In fact, I was fine. I was not even concerned about the outcome. I knew I was fine. I had a distinct awareness that I'm OK. What are they worried about? Well, I went back into my body at some point. I don't remember the details of that or any awareness of that. I just know that when I entered my body, I was in a lot of pain. When I spoke to Father Fitzpatrick, when he was giving me last rites, I had no pain. I remember looking up at him, no pain, none. When I came back into my body after being resuscitated and whatever, Tremendous pain. I had a serious concussion and a, and a laceration that went up through my head because I had hit that axle. I had burns. I had both arms broken. My hands and fingers were broken. I um, broke my back. My ankle was broken. Uh, and I was basically a mess. Ten days later, uh, they were going to fly me to um, Berlin at this big army hospital, but they didn't feel that I could take the flight off the deck, and the whole thing would have been too difficult for my body. Uh, I, I want to uh, simply say that I recovered all the fractures healed within about two months. But unfortunately, I contracted a very serious bone infection in my shoulder which kept me in the hospital for almost 19 months. So I was, the hospital was my home. I had some amazing care and four surgeries in the hospital. But I, I really was touched very deeply by a couple a doctor and a patient. I formed a relationship with a man in the VA hospital who was a paraplegic. His name was Willie Thompson, and he and I became immediate buddies. It was a beautiful experience for me because for six months, we teased each other every day. I cannot tell you how much joy and laughter that I had with Willie. It was, it, was, it was the first man in my life that was there every day. I couldn't wait for him to wake up. We, we started to tease immediately, and we played checkers. Hour after hour, we played checkers. And it, the, the art of the game was to uh, pretend that the loss was really a win. And it was, it, it, it was, we were in a relationship and there were three other people in the room, in this ward. But it was as if they didn't exist. That's how tight we were. Um, I, wanna, I wanna stop that part of the story and uh, relate to what I feel Diane was addressing and why I'm actually sharing this today. The, the veterans, uh, you know, I didn't talk about my near-death experience for almost 30 years because as far as I was concerned, the only way that I could have been sucked into that intake was if I made a mistake and I was ashamed. I was guilty. A lot of men returning and I'm going to say young men. The average age in Iraq today is, I think, 19. I mean, these are kids, They're barely out of high school. A lot of them suffer from shame and guilt. 
they have, uh, if they have an NDE, chances are they have a medical discharge and they're on disability. But they left their buddies. And I can say this about the military. It's, it's a culture. And it's, in my day, it was almost 100% men. It was 100% men aboard the ship. But for many young men, it's the first time in their lives that they've ever had intimacy with other men. And the danger that they face helps create that bonding. They relate to one another as brothers. And then they get sent home because they're injured. So they have a double bind. They may have had a near-death experience, but they've also, a lot of them want to go back. They feel very bad about leaving their buddies. And then there's the whole rationale for even being in the war. Now when you're in it, you don't think about that. You're in the present moment, there's constant danger, constant fear. I'm talking about combat. When I was aboard ship, we weren't in combat, but I was paid an extra hundred dollars a month because I had hazardous duty. It was equivalent to wartime. In 1957, if you were in a war, you got a hundred dollars a month more because it was wartime. But we had a close-knit situation on the flight deck. It was a, a very tight and dangerous situation. There were a number of men that were killed during the uh, uh, deployment that I had. So I guess what I want to uh, reiterate is what Diane said. Uh, these men need to have some inspiration. They need to have affirmation. They need to have affirmation and validation for their NDE, but they need to be with somebody who is present to them. The VA has some wonderful people in it, but it's a government institution, and they have a number, a VA number. And there's so many men in the situation, and women, they, and, they, and they don't trust the government, a lot of them, a lot of them, not all of them. They don't trust the, the VA. So they need somebody outside of the VA, outside of the government, to connect on a human level. And I would encourage you, if you have a story, or you've been studying NDEs, you don't even, listen, when I was four years old, I had a revelation. I was in my foster home. It was not an NDE. A lot of us have had illuminations, revelations, epiphanies, where suddenly we see life and its hidden wisdom. And we never forget those moments. So you don't have to have an NDE to relate to this level of consciousness and to help a veteran who, what they have witnessed and what they have done under the craziness of war, some of the guilt comes from that. They kill civilians, some by accident, some out of a crazed state. It's contagious. I've been serving as a chaplain for nine, almost nine years at the Boulder Community Hospital, and I've studied uh, theology and pastoral psychotherapy. I practiced as a therapist uh, for 12 years, and I'm familiar with scripture. And, you know, it's so in your face that some of the scripture is so elegant. You know, and, and, and a phrase like, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. But that's like in the Bible or over here. 
but we have what we call the real world, which says we've got to defend ourselves against terrorism. And basically, not to get too political about it, but I do feel that war has become a business. It's a business. And they drum up business. And they have a tremendous profit margin in this business. But ideologically, you take a young man and you put him through boot camp and you train him to be a killer. Then he has an NDE. It's, it's counterintuitive. It's against his nature to know that he has deliberately, out of fear and obligation, out of patriotism, out of service, killed somebody else or saw his buddies being killed. So it's a, it's, it's a, uh, a vortex that is just so conflicted. And my own theory is that the NDE, for those who have had them in the military, offers a way of lifting people out of the drama, looking more closely at the purpose in their life, looking at the nature of love. And that's really what it's all about. This life to me, these are my words, my images, my metaphors, but this life to me is about love. And I'm not talking about just love between people. I'm talking about the power of our creative nature, the power of possibility. And when we feel love, there isn't any choice but to re-give it. Love is for re-giving, but you have to be willing to receive it, to be receptive to it. It's what some people would call the receptive principle in this duality that we live in. We receive, let me put it to you this way, when you're born, nobody exhales first. They take in a breath, then they express it, and that's the nature of this embodiment and of the spirit. We, we are graced with this presence that lives through us. We don't have a relationship with it. Those are just linear words. It's very deceptive. This energy animates us. It lives through us. And I think that the support to veterans who are conflicted on so many levels, not to mention their personal levels, before they even got into the military. We all have wounds. We're all veterans of, of wounds. And a lot of us have been very private about it. Very private. So I just want to end this by saying, lend a hand. You'll be glad you did. Oh, one thing. I have a flyer out on the backcountry uh, table with my email address on it. If you're interested in contacting me in any way, uh, you can get my email address at the backcountry. And there's a picture of me in the jet plane, but not, not uh, after I was injured. <laughs>